Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this evening's uh, asthma research webinar. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Vicky Sargent. Um, I've had asthma since the age of 19. Um, and over a journey of a couple of decades, um, I've been diagnosed um, with um, an autoimmune illness, which um, at the same time as that happened, I, I happily fell under the care of the um, respiratory team um, at the uh, hospitals in Oxford at the Churchill and the JR, and uh, was um, able to be involved in some asthma research myself, um, trialing a new drug. So um, I'm here hopefully to add my own insight as well as to uh, facilitate this uh, conversation between um, Tim and myself. We want to thank you very much for your questions that you've already sent in to us. Um, the uh, the session is going to include those and a few more, hopefully. Um, it's going to be a conversation-based um, session between myself um, and Tim. Um, but we do hopefully have the chance for you to pop questions into um, the chat as well so that we might be able to get to those um, at the end of the session. Um, things that occur to you, um, which might be off the back of things that we talk about or might be things that you haven't been able to tell us in advance. Um, so a few technical bits before we get started. Um, if you do want to ask a question uh, during the event, if you can post it in the Q&A box. That's um, at the little speech bubble at the bottom right of your screen. We'll um, do our best to answer that, as I said. Um, to change how we appear um, on the screen as speakers, um, if you go to the ellipsis, that's the three dots at the bottom of the screen um, next to the red phone icon, um, and then you can change your layout um, to suit you um, and then select the sidebar or the spotlight setting and that should give you access to the chat and then to um, Tim and I as we go through the session. Um, as I said, it's going to be um, very conversational. Unfortunately, we won't be able to answer um, any questions about individual health cases, um, uh, mainly for confidentiality, but also because um, we really want to give you broad answers about asthma and about research um, into asthma. Um, so we would advise you, obviously, to talk to healthcare professionals um, and those that you're already um, being looked after if you have any concerns at all. Um, tonight is also being recorded. Um, um, so you'll be sent a copy of that recording. Um, the event is being organised by the National Institute for Healthcare and Research, um, or the NIHR, which we'll try not to use as an acronym and, and too many other acronyms as we go through this evening. Um, it's a government funded body that funds research into the NHS, public health and social care. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the research that goes on um, and to uh, search for studies that you can possibly be um, take part in, um, and sign up um, to be contacted about studies um, that interest you, um, you, you should go and visit the Be Part of Research website. Um, just search for that, those four words, Be Part of Research, um, in uh, a search engine. And uh, remember that you can take part in research studies, even if you are otherwise healthy or have a different you know, health conditions um, as, as opposed to asthma. Um, so, Without further ado, let's introduce you to our resident expert this evening, uh, Professor Tim Hicks. Hi, Tim. Perhaps you'd just like Hi. to say hello um, and let us know um, a little bit about your work, and then we'll get started on some questions. Yes, well, thank you. Yeah, my name is Tim Hicks. I'm an Associate Professor of Respiratory Medicine at the University of Oxford. Um, I can tell you a bit more about myself um, this evening. Um, there are at least two experts on the call. Um, Vicky is a real expert in what it is like to have asthma, and actually um, she's been so helpful in... Um, explaining her story that it's been um she's actually made quite a difference to patients across the country by helping make the case for some of the medicines that some of you may already have and i'm sure many of you have your own stories of asthma as well and you're probably experts in what it's like to to live with asthma or to have a relative or friend who does um but yeah my particular background is that i trained at uh, Cambridge and then Oxford and then I did a PhD in Southampton about mechanisms in asthma and then I spent a couple of years in the University of Melbourne um, doing a postdoctoral fellowship studying um, a sort of immune cell and then I moved back to Oxford uh, five years ago where we've set up a, a research group and I work with someone called Professor Ian Paywood who's um, a very big name in asthma so um, we live and breathe asthma it's great fun um, but it's also a, a disease which we're desperate to make real progress in. Thanks, Tim. Um, I can attest to all the people in that team being incredibly uh, wonderful and uh, experts in what they do um, and um, a pleasure to, to be looked after and to, um, to help as well. Um, 
Okay, so let's um, get going uh, with what people really want to hear from us this evening. Um, and I'll ask you quite a broad question to begin with, I think. Um, but um, maybe you could start by telling us a bit about um, asthma in the population. How common is it? Um, and uh, a little bit about how it affects and who it affects. Um, and then what are some of the most recent research um, results and, and programmes um, that are going on in asthma treatment um, and prevention? Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Vicky. So asthma is very common. It's the world's most common long term lung disease and worldwide it affects about 350 million people. So in UK, it's particularly common. About one in 11 children and one in 12 adults um, have asthma. And this is really interesting because it used to be seen as a fairly rare disease. Um, if you go back to the 1950s, asthma was much less common and we had no good treatments for it. And it was something which was terrifying and often left people um, uh, dying at a young age. And that's all changed with modern treatments. But if you meet people in their 70s and 80s, many of them would have bad asthma or actually went to special schools just set apart for kids with asthma because it was such a rare condition. And yet now, um, you know, we are in the average classroom there'll be three children with asthma the other interesting thing is i mean it, it, it's increased so rapidly and nobody knows why we've got some theories but between about the 1970s and and year 2000 it, it at least doubled here in, in uk and it's particularly a problem in uk now, the highest rates of asthma in the world are seen in um scotland jersey guernsey the isle of man united kingdom and then that's followed by new zealand australia and america and it seems that it's a british problem and where we've gone with our colonies seems to have particularly taken that problem with us. You do get in all sorts of people, but we don't really know what there is driving this particular explosion of asthma recently and it being such a problem in the UK. So lots of research to be done there. Fantastic. Yes, and that will lead into some other questions that I've got um, around environment, I think, and, and, and pollution and things. And I know when I first was um, diagnosed with asthma myself, I learned a lot about how the weather affects us in this country and the Gulf Stream and, you know, damp conditions. Yeah. And anyone who's uh, suffered from asthma will know that um, all those environmental factors can be quite tricky to manage. Thank you very much for that. Um, so, Vicky, I didn't answer your second question, which was about some search results. And the question is, how recent and how exciting? Mm. I think... Um, there are all sorts of different um, studies going on at minutes and some of the most exciting findings recently. One has been about fixed dose lab ICS treatment. So I can explain that. Um, <laughs> when I was training uh, not so many years ago, people were used to having a brown inhaler and a blue inhaler. And one would be your preventer and one would be your reliever medicine. And the big problem with that is people become dependent on the reliever medicine and they're not so good at using the... Um, Guilty. The, 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 the brown one, yes. We're, um, we're all guilty. It's very hard to take any medicine twice a day without fail. Uh, and as a result, um, we were having a lot of people having exacerbations, flares of their asthma, just because they weren't using the blue inhaler. And so a friend of mine, Gary Anderson, suggested we stick the blue and the brown together and make a combination inhaler, something which can act really quickly and relieve symptoms, but can also protect you. Every dose you take which, protect, uh, which treats your symptoms will treat the underlying condition. And that started in severe asthma and then moderate asthma. And now um, in the last uh, couple of years, there've been some really big clinical trials in UK and Australia and uh, around the world, which have shown that even in people with really mild asthma, the best treatment is to have a fixed dose combination inhaler, just one inhaler. It might be a dry powder inhaler or a puffer version, but you take it when you have symptoms and you don't take it when you don't need it. Uh, and that's really making treatment much easier for people with asthma and it's going to reduce the number of people being admitted to hospital with asthma and I hope it'll reduce the um, people dying of asthma. So that's one big research finding, a new treatment. Another new treatment was something called the AMAZES study which I got excited about, it published in 2017. This was finding that an antibiotic called azithromycin can reduce the risk of you having flares of asthma and I spent the last five years trying to work out how it works, um, why it works, but we do know that it does work. This was a really phenomenal study. Um, they looked at 420 people in Australia and showed that giving this low dose antibiotic for a year reduced the number of asthma exacerbations by at least 40%. And in some people, it has a really dramatic effect. If you want to hear more about why that is, I can, I can tell you later. Um, and then lastly, um, in our own lab group, we've been finding a, a prediction score which can personalize um, treatment for asthma. So we've developed an, an app and um, 
when you're in clinic, a doctor can measure inflammation in your lungs and can predict how likely it is that you're going to have further asthma attacks this year. And that can help um, guide how much treatment to give. So a flavor of different things, uh, new treatments, new prediction scores, and lots of basic science going on as well. That's fantastic. And it's nice to hear, isn't it, that um, we can do some things around preventative medicine as well in amongst all of that, as well as um, finding drugs to treat. Um, I've actually also started on one of those inhalers. So I now have a combined drug inhaler um, and GPs um, are very good now, I think, at getting people to swap where they can. So that's making um, that's making a real difference to people. Um, this ties in this next question to what you've just been talking about actually um, one of our first questions from um, our webinar uh, watchers and listeners is um, are there any new treatments available to treat lifelong asthma so it kind of gets into what you're talking about with um, uh, with that inhaler but uh, I know there's been lots of new drugs come online in the sort of last 10 years or so yeah I mean my, my granny had asthma and had bad asthma until she died at the age of 101 um, yeah. some forms of asthma are with you for a for a century, others aren't. And so one of the really big steps that research has shown, um, even from uh, people um, within our group over the last few years, is that there are different sorts of asthma. And looking at what one person's asthma is um, can really help guide what it's gonna be like for them uh, and, and how to treat it. In the past, we used to just say asthma was mild, moderate or severe, but now we've realized there are different forms of it. and. Uh, Vicky knows that working out how, what her particular form of asthma means that we've got a very specific targeted treatment. And so some people will have asthma as a child and they'll grow out of it. That form, childhood onset allergic asthma, um, is probably the commonest form. And often it gets better um, when you're a teenager. Um, certainly amongst boys, it tends to go away. And um, other forms of asthma develop later in life. Um, interestingly, after puberty, women tend to develop asthma more than men, and we don't understand that. And people in our group are working on working out why that is at the minute. But a particular problem is adult onset asthma and a form called eosinophilic asthma, which we can explain more about later. But if you get that adult onset asthma, it's often harder to treat, and um, that eosinophilic asthma um, will never go away. We don't yet have a cure for it, but we do now have treatments. So asthma can last lifelong. Childhood forms you often grow out of. Adult forms can be more problematic. Hmm. This is leading very nicely into a few questions we've got coming up, actually. Um, but yet I have eosinophilic asthma. And um, yes, it's uh, it's not going anywhere. But um, the treatment that I'm on is, is working wonders. So um, in fact, someone has actually said, um, can your asthma decline if you were diagnosed as a teenager or do you have it for the rest of your life? So I think you've just touched on the two sort of real different types of asthma there. Um, yes, and, and there are more than two types, but um, uh, partly in, in young, young children, the airways are smaller and as you grow, they get bigger and that makes asthma less problematic. Also, allergies can fluctuate and um, young people's asthma tends to be driven by allergies. That's not true in later life. But allergic asthma, your immune system is adapting all the time to the environment. And um, it's, it's possible that you just um, uh, become less responsive and you grow out of your allergies. Also, um, there, is some, um, there are some ways to treat the allergic tendency with something called sublingual immunotherapy. We're not doing much of that in UK, but the idea is that um, you give low doses of um, an allergen, let's say you're allergic to house dust mite or grass pollen, you give um, low doses of grass allergen under the tongue um, in a safe environment in a hospital um, at multiple outpatient appointments. And over a number of weeks, it can actually induce a, an, a protective response in your immune mm. system and damp down the asthma. That's particularly popular in America and in Australia. Mm. but. Um, at the minute there's not much funding for it in uk and it's quite a commitment to undergo that and actually it's not as effective as some of the other treatments no i, I looked into that desensitization a long time ago before i was properly de um, diagnosed and it is incredibly popular in in america but um yeah not not so much here that's really interesting um i'll i'll, I'll ask one of the questions that's further down my list actually because it ties in again with what you've just been talking about someone's actually said um i have asthma my daughter has asthma, my mother has asthma, my grandmother and my great-great-grandmother had asthma. Um, we can trace asthma in our family all the way back to the 1830s, which is quite something. Um, is there research into a genetic link for female inherited asthma? And I know, Tim, that you've just got some important funding for looking into why women do 
seem to develop asthma more more than men and suffer from it um, worse worse than men. So um, that's quite an interesting question to take. So th this is my favourite question from, from the list which should come in already. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm so excited about this for a number of reasons. Um, uh, as Vicky said, uh, I, we've got um, £98,000 of funding from Asthma and Lung UK to look at why it is that asthma is worse in women than men. And we, we, well, um, the way we're doing that is we've got 11 data sets from around the world from what's called bronchoscopy studies where people have had a flexible camera test to look in their lungs and we've measured thousands of different genes simultaneously. And with that huge database, we, we are combining them all and just looking at the difference between men and women. And we've got someone called a bioinformatician who's an expert in teasing apart complex data sets. And he's already discovered something similar in a disease called hepatitis C where women and men responded very differently. And he found out the reason for it. It was a difference in a molecule called interferon lambda. And it may well be the same thing in, in, uh, in asthma. So he's looking at that. So I hope within a year, we'll start getting some answers about why it is that women and men are different with their asthma. Some of it's due to hormones. And we know that um, after puberty and before the menopause, women have more asthma, they have more severe asthma, they're more likely to be in hospital with asthma. Um, and many people experience um, asthma worsening around the time of the period, and we don't understand the mechanisms for that. So there's a lot of work left to do. But secondly, we're very interested in the genetic causes of asthma. Mm -hmm. And in my research group, we're doing something called whole genome sequencing. And this is really cool. You, you measure... Um, the whole genome of a person. You might remember the Human Genome Project. And once upon a time, the first human genome cost $2 billion. It took 20 laboratories around the world, um, 12 years to sequence a single genome. Um, now with the equipment we've got in our lab, we could do that in 48 hours, um, 500 pounds. And we're, <laughs> we're trying to sequence 500 people at a whole genome level. So we measure every one of the 3 billion genetic points in, in your genome um, and we're looking at that in two sorts of ways one we're looking at groups of people with similar asthma and also we're looking at people with rare forms of asthma and um, you, what you describe in your family it being in women at multiple generations is not normal that's quite unusual and if you would like to potentially be involved in our particular research project, um, I'd love to hear from you. What I'll do is I'll put my email address in the chat there. This is specifically that person who's asked about that question if you're on the call. Um, because it might be possible, if you want to take part in that study, to, to measure the whole genomes in some family members, which would usually be with a blood test. Um, and it, um, it, that work is being led by one of my students called Anna Fries, who is fantastic. She's, um, she's a, a doctor with a specialist interest in asthma and she's doing a PhD at the minute. And um, uh, she's collecting families with unusual forms of asthma. Um, and the, the mix of um, my bioinformatician interested in female asthma and Anna interested in genetic rare forms of asthma could be really great. So if you're interested, then drop, drop us an email in the next couple of days. Um, I hope that's answered the question, but if you want more on it, then do ping it back to me. Asthma doesn't usually run in families. Um, it's just, it's quite a common disease. And so um, mm. if I had asthma, it would be not uncommon for my daughter to have it or my son. But to be able to go back to the 1830s implies there is something probably linked to the X chromosome. And just the last thing to say is women have two X chromosomes, men have one. Um, quite a lot of the immune response genes are on your X chromosome. And we realize now that sex differences are really important in lots of diseases. You think about COVID and men were twice as likely to die as women. Um, that's because of those X chromosome differences. Uh, when men say they have man flu, it probably is a real thing. Um, they do have a stronger <laughs> inflammatory response. Um, but obviously <laughs> I've never been a woman, so I, I, I can't experience that. I'm, I'm making absolutely no comment on that. That's way too contentious um, for our webinar. But yes, um, I think um, what I learned when I was learning about my illness and, you know, it's a, an autoimmune illness is that um, the sort of swelling and inflammation that goes along with that is is an area of science which is very interesting for all kinds of illnesses um, going forward. So um, I think looking at my list, um, I'm going to ask a bit about... Um, 
people are quite interested i think in the chat as well about you know possible new inhalers and things but someone here's got a very interesting question um they said as a lifelong asthmatic um using daily ventolin which goes back to to what you were saying earlier about preventers and, and relievers um um i recently experienced a 95 percent reduction in symptoms after starting a very low carbohydrate diet um is there any research into the effects of of low carbohydrate diets and asthma and I'd like to add into that that um, there's probably research to be done, isn't there, about the effects of, of food and what we eat, as well as them being allergens. And I know that dairy, cutting out dairy sometimes can help with asthma symptoms a bit. Yeah, thank you for that question. I'm not an expert on the um, on diet and asthma. I've heard a lot of patients say that um, cutting out dairy products affects their asthma. And I've always meant to look into it, and I haven't yet. Um, but... Uh, there are some forms of asthma which are quite sensitive to food. Um, and in particular, there, there's something called salicylates and sulfur dioxide. So these are two different things. Um, salicylates are related to aspirin. Um, they're naturally occurring molecules. Um, and you particularly get them in dried fruits and, um, uh, and, uh, and preservatives in, in, in various foods. About one in six people with asthma has aspirin-sensitive asthma. Yeah, Vicky's one of them. And it often goes with having nasal polyps. And I think, Vicky, you've got nasal mm -hmm. polyps. Yeah. <laughs> and so this, this particular form of asthma, having nasal polyps, um, sensitivity to aspirin and asthma, is the, it's called Samter's triad. And it, it was discovered uh, over 100 years ago. It's the oldest form of asthma. Um, if you've got that form of asthma and you're sensitive to aspirin, then um, it may be that salicylates can worsen your um, worsen your asthma, and avoiding them might reduce things. The problem is trying to cut salicylates out of your diet completely is a real faff, and you can end up on exclusion diets where you where you don't have a sensible diet. And I don't usually recommend salicylate <laughs> because I can attest to this. <laughs> <laughs> they're just yeah. a nightmare, and they don't have that much efficacy. Um, mm. Other people have. Um, and if you've got that form of asthma and it's bad, then you do really well to be on the sort of medicine that um, Vicky is taking, which is called Japilimab, which um, is just come out in UK um, back in uh, March last year. And we're trying to make that available from people who've got really severe form of asthma and sensitive asthma. The, the other thing is sulfur dioxide. And that might be in your low carbohydrate. It might be you've cut out salicylates inadvertently or you've cut out sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide is a commonly used food preservative and you particularly get it in wines, cheap wines. So maybe buy a more expensive <laughs> wine um, and in beers and again in dried fruits. Um, mm. And if you read this contains sulfites, then that, that can be a warning. Some people are sensitive to sulfites, but most people aren't going to get much benefit from changing their diet, I'm afraid. That's like a little flashback of my life in that conversation <laughs> before I, you know, entered into the research that I was lucky enough to do um, uh, with your team um, about five, six years ago. Now, I tried absolutely everything. I tried cutting out salicylates because I know that that's a trigger for me. And I also had anaphylaxis from having too, having too much um, of that before. And, uh, and you know, all, all the things. Uh, dairy, I think, just helps you cut out mucus. I think that's the theory. <laughs> I think that's the theory behind that. But yes, and the sulfites in wine, I was... I was devastated when about 15 years ago someone said to me you really need to stop drinking that wine so um so they're but, not in the more expensive labels no right. organic wine is what you need if anyone's listening yeah. if you're trying to avoid um, um sulfites go down the organic route um but happy to say that with dupilumab which um, i could wax lyrical about um all day um i have no problems with any foods anymore and um, i can also drink wine and so all those triggers that that used to happen um my body that the mechanism that goes into overdrive has just been stopped by that drug so I'm, I'm a great fan of that drug and a, and a, a great um, proponent for getting involved in, in research as I'll say a bit more about later hopefully. Um, talking about Jupilumab, um, let's let's go to a, a question about another MAB and perhaps you can explain what MABs are and um, uh, you know what they are in, in terms of a, a new wave of medicines really for all kinds of autoimmune um, problems. Someone's actually said um, will the use of and you can tell me if I've pronounced this correctly Omalazumab um, for asthma and nasal polyps become more common and are the side effects worth the risk? Now, I don't know, Tim, whether this is an older drug than the one that I'm taking. Um, and I can talk a little bit about side effects in a minute if you like, but um, I'm not, I don't know how much you know about that drug. 
Yeah, I'm very happy to talk about it. Just to draw attention to the chat, I think there's some mm. more questions being on Google Doc. So Omar um I mentioned that I did my PhD in Southampton, jointly between Southampton and Japan. Omar Lijamab was the first um, biologic agent developed for asthma, and it was a it was a success story at the time because it was the first injectable treatment for asthma, which was really targeted just at treating the severe allergic form of asthma. Um, so it was a um, it's an injection under the skin every um, two to four weeks, um, and what it does is it binds to immunoglobulin E. Immunoglobulin sits on various cells in your lungs and um, if you have um, things like anaphylaxis or severe allergy to house dust mite or to nuts or whatever it's the IgE which is triggering that and this is an antibody which we inject under the skin and it binds to that IgE and, it, and it, it, it blocks it so it's particularly effective for people with nasal polyposis and with severe allergic asthma who if you go to a doctor's um, at a a hospital they'll do a, um, either skin prick testing or multiple allergen testing and if you come up very strongly positive with high levels of IgE then omelizumab may be helpful. It tends to be given to younger people because it's more childhood onset often people who've got eczema as well and bad hay fever. However we're not using it as much as we thought we would because there are newer biologics which have come on the market which mm. are better they're just more effective they're actually cheaper to use um, and they treat a wider variety of people. So in Oxford, we've got about 40 people on omelizumab, and on the other biologics, we've got uh, about 650 people on other newer wow. biologics. I didn't realize and that. It's just, uh, um, yeah, well, five years ago, we had 10 people on the other biologics, and we've been very busy. In the last five years, we've <laughs> started nearly 700 people on biologics. Um, so, uh, uh, the nice things about omelizumab, it's really good if people have got something called chronic urticaria. Some people find their skin turns mm -hmm. red when they're exposed to certain substances. Um, it's really good if you've got nasal polyps and allergy. And it's also the oldest biologic, which means it's been used in a lot of people. And so, often people who are getting pregnant want to have a biologic which has been around for longest. And we know that omelizumab has got the best safety data. Personally, I think that all the biologics are safe in asthma, but would you rather have a drug which has only been out for a year or one which has been used for 15, 20 years? We'd always go for the older drug in people who are getting pregnant. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I can I can say a little bit about, um, I don't know whether anyone's got there. Actually, I didn't mention the side effects. I, I should briefly mention the side effects. There are very few side effects to these biologics, which is great. Omelizumab, um, all of these biologics, when you inject them under the skin, some people get a bit of redness in the skin um, and some people get a bit of a sore throat or nasopharyngitis, so it feels like you've got a bit of a cold. But it, we've not seen any severe reactions to any of our biologics. In theory, anyone who's being injected with a medicine might get an anaphylactic reaction to the medicine, but that's very rare. And um, there's a slight increased risk of getting shingles, strangely. We don't know why. But um, if you're on the newer biologic medicines, then it doubles your risk of shingles. So we often suggest that people get a chickenpox vaccine. But otherwise, these are some of the safest medicines we've got available, and they're very mm. effective. Yeah, no, I can attest to that dupilumab, and I had absolutely negligible um, symptoms, really, um, side effects from it. Um, in the first year of taking it, I used to get dry eyes um, for a little while after after taking the jab, and that's a jab I do every two weeks. But other than that, it's been really been a wonder drug, and uh, my asthma is so much more under control because of it. I'm just very quickly going to have a look at the questions that have come up in our chat. Um, so we were talking a little bit about um, eosinophilic asthma um, a minute ago. Um, so the related question that we had already was, um, someone said, I developed eosinophilic asthma in the summer of 2021 um, at the age of 44. Um, is that common? Is adult asthma common um, at that age? Um, yes, thank you for that question. It, um Strangely, that form of asthma, the eosinophilic form, is very common at that sort of age. So eosinophilic asthma is probably the most severe form of asthma we've got. Um, when you have a blood test done at the GP, they'll measure a whole load of different blood cells in your, in your blood, like red cells and different white cells and neutrophils. The eosinophils are a little cell which most people ignore. 
um, because they're, they're not very common. But for some reason, some people get too many eosinophils in their blood and they get into the lungs and the nose and they're like little bombs waiting to go off. If you get a cold or um, you, you're unwell for any other reason, they, they can trigger um, a lot of local inflammation in the lungs and cause a lot of mucus to be produced in your lungs, which can be hard to cough out, very sticky um, uh, mucus, which is hard to get out. It can block up the very small airways uh, and uh, it can be a life-threatening forms of asthma. The good news about eosinophilic asthma is it responds really well to tablet steroids. If you start taking tablet steroids within one to two days, the symptoms really um, melt away and people feel great on them. The bad news is that steroid tablets like prednisolone have lots of side effects. Unlike the biologic drugs, these cause whole loads. Some of you will have had lots of steroids and you'll know all about this. They can affect your mood. They can make you depressed or even um, a bit manic. Um, they can thin your bones. They can thin the skin. They can cause you to put on weight. Um, they can cause your face to go round, um, skin to get thin and um, uh, more hairy. Uh, they put up your blood pressure. They cause diabetes. They affect your mm -hmm. eyes. Um, so steroids used regularly are really bad, which is why we're using biologics. But if you developed eosinophilic asthma age 40, um, then it's important that if you find you're having three or more courses of tablet steroids each year, that you ask to be referred to a specialist centre for consideration of having one of these new biologics, because we don't want you having this long-term side effects of steroids. Um, it's really interesting, why is it people develop this when they've been fine to the age of 40? And that's a question one of my PhD students, James Melhorn, is studying. And he's got a theory that it's to do with something called clonal hematopoiesis, which is just that as you get older, um, some cells in your body go rogue in the bone marrow and they start producing <laughs> too many ears in the fields. And he's doing lots more genetic sequencing on people who've got this form of asthma to, to see as they get older, is that happening? Cells going rogue happens more as you get older and we find 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, um, it becomes more common and ears in the asthma does the same. So that's our theory. If he's right, we'll have found the, the cause of the disease and it might lead to some cures. Um, I mean, Vicky says she's going to have asthma lifelong, but Actually, I'm optimistic that in the next 20 years, we might have started coming up with some real cures which could eradicate asthma, but um, it depends on the work which is going on at the minute. And depends how many people can help us and volunteer for that to, to be guinea yeah. pigs as well. Um, thank you. Um, great answer. Um, I just wanted to very quickly pick up, thankfully someone's answered um, Patricia's. Um, question about those inhalers um, and yes I can attest that if you go to your GP and see your GP or the asthma nurse at your GP they will be very keen to get you onto a new type of inhaler at the moment that's that's going on that work apace and someone's put they're typically called Foster or Simba Court there are many of them now and um, I wanted to just very quickly take um, a question about someone's asked us if we can talk a little bit about how inhalers um, can be made more environmentally friendly and um, we were talking about this the other day I've I've literally just started on one which is a powder inhaler as opposed to the pressurized gas um, in inhaler and um, I thought you might want to comment on that Tim. Yeah thank you it's a great question. Um, the propellants in inhalers are a problem. Uh, 10 years ago they or 15 years ago they were bad for the ozone layer and so we switched propellants and actually getting rid of Freon which is found in old fridges and uh, an old aerosol spray has made a big difference. The ozone layer is gradually healing um, although in Australia they've still got quite a big hole and uh, there are people dying of um, melanoma as a result, skin cancer. Um, so it's great that we switched away from CFCs, which were driving the hole in the ozone layer. The, the new propellants currently are really bad for, the, um, for their carbon footprint. Um, they're about a thousand times as bad as carbon dioxide. There's not very much in an inhaler, but um, the, the carbon footprint of one um, salbutamol inhaler is equivalent to a round trip from Oxford to Leicester and back by car um, and added up the inhalers we prescribe in the NHS cause 3.7 percent of the entire carbon footprint of the NHS that includes people commuting to work for the NHS so we've got five million people on in these inhalers they've got a bad carbon footprint so there's good news there's two sorts of good news one is that the dry powder inhalers are at least 20 times better and they're much more environmentally friendly and we're beginning to be able to recycle the um, plastics of the inhaler as well so when you finish your inhalers you can take them back to your pharmacy 
and they can dispose of them properly. So switching from a puffer version to a dry powder can be helpful. I think they're much easier to use. They've got a longer shelf life. They, um, it's quite, e quite hard to use a puffer version of an inhaler accurately without making some mistakes. And sometimes mm -hmm. you have to carry a volumatic around if you're a spacer device, which doesn't really fit in your handbag. Um, so dry powders are good for most people. But the other good news is that the inhaler companies are doing what they can about this and they're bringing out some new propellants. Um, even within the year ahead, we think that um, Chiesi, who make the Foster Air inhaler, will bring out a new propellant and these will be much better for the environment. So um, there's a lot of awareness about it. Within a year or two, we should be having better puffer inhalers. But in the meantime, uh, you should consider using a dry powder inhaler. On the continent, dry powder inhalers are the, are the number one sort of inhaler. In UK, for some reason, 70% of our inhalers prescribed are puffers, and that's for historical reasons. And um, mm. I'm generally favouring the dry powder versions. I can Foster recommend. Yeah, I can recommend. I, it took me a few of them um, before I got one that worked very well for me. But now and I can feel that the more of the medicine gets into my lungs with, with a powder than it ever did, um, trying to cope with you know a pressurized puff of <laughs> puff of air um there's a really interesting question in our chat which i it's it's um i don't know whether you'll be able to answer this tim it says regarding insurance companies and um, whenever i get travel insurance i'm always asked um when my asthma was diagnosed um and i think just to, to qualify basically um that was about um the difference between yeah so is there is a difference between asthma being diagnosed under the age of 50 and over the age of 50 um is that clinically important yeah thank you so age is a really important factor in asthma uh, because asthma varies over days over minutes over months over years and um if it's um your insurance company are only asking you when it was diagnosed because they asked that about any medical problem i think um they may be concerned specifically if you've had it for many many years you might have permanent damage to your lungs which can't be reversed with the inhalers um and uh i mean my grandmother with her 100 years of asthma ended up with emphysema and, and it was as though she had smoked all her life and she hadn't she just had bad untreated asthma for many years mm. um she was born at the wrong time she didn't get our new biologic drugs but i i, I wouldn't worry too much about when it was diagnosed i don't think it'll affect your insurance premium much uh, if it was diagnosed when you're a child or when you're an adult if it's diagnosed over the age of 50, it does tend to be a more severe form and um, more likely to be that is in a philic asthma or asthma related to obesity, which we've not talked about. But obesity related asthma tends to develop later in life. But if you're developing asthma in your 50s, it's almost certainly is in a philic asthma. Um, and so it's important. I, I think one key message I'd like to get across is that steroids are very good for one or two courses. But if you are regularly needing long-term steroids or frequent course of steroids, um, you should get help. And we, we go out to GP practices and search through databases of records and find people who are having eight courses of steroids a year. That's not acceptable anymore. Um, the world has changed. And um, if you're using a lot of steroids, then you should be referred to a, a secondary care hospital. Um, or um, if they think you might benefit from one of these new biologics, you have to be referred on to one of the 10 specialist centres in the country where you'll meet a team who are used to prescribing these and decide whether they're really ready for you. Just one other thing to say is that not everyone who's got asthma has really got asthma. Um, we were talking about this yesterday at Asthma and Lung UK headquarters, and um, some studies suggested up to one in three people who are taking asthma inhalers don't actually have asthma. There are other conditions that can look very similar, such mm. as breathing pattern disorder or vocal cord problems and it can be quite hard to diagnose them so uh, if things aren't right then do yeah we, we, we're always pleased to see people in our, our secondary care clinics sort out a problem uh, and maybe get some people off asthma inhalers um, or the worst thing is if you if you don't have asthma but you're treated with asthma you get given inhalers it doesn't work so then you're given steroids and they don't work so we give you more steroids and you can end up getting a lot of side effects and you never mm. actually have asthma and mm. it, there is no really good diagnostic test for asthma and some of the other work we're going on at the doing at the minute is developing new diagnostic tests for asthma so at asthma lung uk headquarters yesterday we were talking about um, some new diagnostic tests uh, many of which are you going to use simple breathing tests which uh, are much easier to use than the current tests and more accurate. Some of them measure the amount of nitric oxide being released in, in your breathing. Some of them measure other things called volatile organic compounds. Um, 
these are really cutting edge research. We measure tiny amounts of molecules which are produced in your breath and they're different between people with asthma and people who are healthy. And we've got new detectors which can pick these up. Some sorts of research, you blow into a big bag and you collect 10 litres of air and it gets sent away for mass spectrometry. But a device I'm working with, an inventor called Victor Higgs, um, he's developed a nano detector, which is um, a sensor which costs five pounds. It's got 16 different components built into it, which measure 16 different things that you're breathing out. Um, and it uses artificial intelligence to analyze that data and can predict whether you've got asthma or not. Um, with something which is so simple and, and cheap to use, we're trying to see if this might be accurate enough to be used in general practice. If so, mm. that'd be great. We could get these out to GPs across the country and decrease the number of people who misdiagnose with asthma. Um, so do take part in research. We, at the minute we're doing early phase work where we're optimizing it and trying to get improved people we know who are healthy or know who have asthma, but um, uh, we're submitting a grant literally this week to ask for two million pounds of funding to do that. If it's successful, then the next stage would be testing this in hundreds of people um, in primary care across the country. There's great research going on up in um, Manchester area uh, where they're testing these devices. Someone called Professor S Stephen Fowler uh, is trialing these exhaled breath um, devices. Um, yeah. That would be absolutely amazing. And I think it ties into what um, Asmina has just said. Um, thank you in, in the chat. You know, do, do you think we need to do some campaigning on asthma and preventative work? And I think there's there's definitely, you know, obviously a reluctance to to abs send absolutely everybody who might have asthma to see a specialist because, you know, there, there's a lot of people, obviously. Um, and if GPs were able to do um, some very quick diagnosis about um, asthma um, and uh, see who needs to be referred, then, then that might be... A great, a great way forward, preventatively. Yeah, can I just pick up on that, uh, Asmina? Mm. I'm just going to paste uh, Asthma and Lung UK in, in the chat. This was Asthma UK, which is a, uh, the asthma charity, have merged with the British Lung Foundation. And we were talking yesterday about campaigning. Um, at Asthma and Lung UK, who are based in um, Mansell Street in London, they've, they've got people who are petitioning the government for funding uh, to, to improve asthma care, but also asthma research. And... Uh, if you've got time and energy um, and, and think you might get involved in supporting that work or, or campaigning, then do be in touch with them. Uh, they're, they're also major asthma funders. They're funding our work on um, the, the Stephen Fowler's work on asthma detection and prevention. And they're funding our work on um, how asthma is different in women. Uh, and they're very supportive. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's so much research which needs doing, but the, the fun thing is that Britain is becoming one of the best places in the world to do asthma research, if not the best place, because um, centres across the country are working collaboratively, particularly NIH, our National Institute for Health Research, um, are encouraging us to, to work collaboratively together. And, and yesterday I spent the day in, Lon in London with a bunch of researchers from Southampton, London, um, Manchester, Northern Ireland, working out how we can share our research projects so we're not doing little ones which are competing with each other but doing joined up projects where we all say well here's one project i want to do we'll do it at all the centers in the country i'd love to tell you a bit about some of the um the projects which are going on at the minute if you want um i'm conscious i've got about 15 minutes so i'll definitely come back to that in a minute if that's okay and very quickly ask a couple of the things that are left over from our um webinar joiners and um, very quickly i just wanted um to pick up on what patricia had put um she's asking about montelukast tablets and i know that they were used for a while but i'm, I'm not sure they're they're prescribed that that much anymore for asthma so um it's all about what sort of asthma you've got again mm. Glucose tablets aren't very useful for most people, but um, they are useful for people, particularly with mild allergic asthma and nasal polyposis. So if you have a milder form of the disease that Vicky's got, then they can be helpful. So uh, they're also useful in young people with exercise-induced asthma. Um, they're off patent, which means they're cheap to prescribe. They're there in the asthma guidelines. Um, Side effects, that there's only one side effect really, so that they do cause some people to have um, bad nightmares. If that happens to you, then come off them. But mm. uh, yeah, if you've got that form of asthma, which is um, you've got a lot of nasal polyp disease um, or you've got exercise-induced asthma, then they can be helpful. 
Yeah, that exercise induced asthma, which used to be called work induced, didn't it, asthma? Um, sort of ties in with another quick question from someone. Um, how does stress trigger asthma and how much do we know about stress and asthma? And I know there's two types of stress, really. There's the stress that you could put on your body. And then there's also, you know, uh, the stress from your um, fight or fight uh, system that, that might um, tie into asthma attacks as well. Yeah, so it's it's really well recognized that some people well we all have different triggers for asthma some people are triggered by stress i was reading the biography of a politician i won't name him but he went through a difficult time and he describes during this really stressful week when his world was falling apart sitting on a park bench in central london having a dreadful asthma attack and mm. just such a beautiful description of um, stress-induced asthma it's not not what everyone experiences but it is common and we don't understand the mechanism but some of the research gone uh, over the last two or three years is very exciting it's about the nerves in the airways and how um we're now able to take biopsies from from the airways and look at the nerves with immunofluorescent imaging so you take these beautiful three-dimensional pictures where the nerves light up in green or red and you can see the nerve endings um synapsing that's joining onto the inflammatory cells like the ears inner fields and the mast cells wow. these are the, the, the troublemakers in the lungs but they're talking to the nerves and Incredible. your brain when it's stressed drives a nerve called the vagus nerve which mm. goes down it innervates the lung and in some people with asthma it can um, trigger those ears and fields to activate and release all the inflammatory products which causes your airways to close up causes more mucus production it can happen very quickly and uh yeah, it can be very frightening having an asthma attack. Um, so we're, we're complex people and, and as individuals, we don't just have a brain and a set of lungs, they're inter interrelated. Yeah. If you're going through a stressful time, it can also affect stress hormones and uh, we know that um, stress hormones are related to asthma. Interesting, the prednisolone tablets that we give people are a form of stress hormone and when you're more stressed, you produce more steroids. When we give tablets, we're, we're kind of simulating that a bit which is fine in the short term, but in the long term, it's got side effects. Mm. Um, that leads yeah. me very, very nicely, actually, <laughs> into a question about cortisol levels, which we've got. Um, someone says, I have very low cortisol, cortisol levels due to steroid use to control severe asthma. Um, why does that occur? How is it treated? And is there a knock-on effect of medication for other medical problems, such as atrial fibrillation? Okay. So, yeah. So your cortisol is produced by your adrenal glands these are glands which sit mm. in your kidneys and when you're stressed you produce more cortisol but actually you have to produce a certain amount of cortisol every day many of you will have had prednisolone tablets and i'm sure you will have ha had these or hydrocortisone injections um if you've got an asthma attack we'll often give eight tablets a day 40 milligrams of prednisolone for mm. five days um actually your, your adrenals should be producing about three to five milligrams of prednisolone equivalent that much cortisol each day now if you're given many courses of steroids in a year or you've had them for many months on end your adrenals can go to sleep and they can stop producing those cortisol right. and then if you stop taking tablets you can end up very ill um, mm. you, you can end up with a low blood pressure low blood glucose levels um, you can faint or even go unconscious and so we, we, we're worried about people who've had a lot of steroid tablets and if you've got low cortisol levels the key thing is it's important that you don't suddenly stop your steroids they have to be weaned down slowly and carefully and sometimes we replace prednisolone tablets with um, a short-acting thing called hydrocortisone. It's a tablet you take three times a day. The reason we do that is overnight, um, when the levels of that tablet are low, your adrenals gradually get into the habit of producing cortisol again. Young people, you can usually wean them off these steroid tablets and you can get back to full health. Older people over the age about 60 or above, often people are left on long-term low-dose steroids. But if you're only taking about five milligrams of prednisolone, or 10 milligrams of hydrocortisone a day, then you're probably producing what your adrenals would otherwise be doing. Um, it shouldn't affect your other treatments, uh, but um, yeah, it's okay. in the cortisol level which can do that. Yeah. Mm, absolutely. So I'll ask a few other quick questions. Um, and I know we've got uh, uh, quite a, a tight um, close date of close time of eight o'clock tonight, unfortunately. Um, I'm going to ask you about your research wish list and some other things that are going on to finish in just a minute, Tim, um, to let you um, wax lyrical and think blue sky about that. One of my questions was going to be, are we at a point now with lots of the new medicines that we've got um, that we don't see asthma as a particularly or 
potentially, I mean, you were talking about even cures in, in a couple of decades time. Um, when I was first diagnosed with asthma, I was given lots of information about the fact that it would be degenerative. And over time, my, my lungs would really suffer and I'd feel it in my old age. Is that hopefully not so much the case now? Yeah. So um, it depends depends when you're born and how bad your asthma mm, is. Yeah. If you've had severe asthma and you've had it for many years, um, the, the airways get um, fibrosive, it's scarred, mm, the, the brittle in your airway um, uh, builds up and uh, and it becomes irreversible and the inhalers stop working and there's not much we can do. And um, really over the last year actually, there's been a real um, discussion in the research community about predicting and preventing mm. that, trying to get people on these really potent medicines much sooner so the damage isn't done. Um, uh, and uh, you know, Ian Pavel is the head of our department and one of the global opinion leaders in asthma and um, he was talking even yesterday with his asthma and lung UK researchers um, about new studies we could do to provide the evidence we need to justify to the government giving more biologics to people at an earlier age. As I say, mm. we don't have much in the way of side effects, they're very effective, but we don't want to wait until people have got irreversible lung damage. We want to get them in earlier. At the minute, our priority as doctors is just trying to find the hidden people who are out there. Uh, We've started about 700 people in, uh, in the Thames Valley region on biologics. We predict there are about 300 more people, but we need to get first. So let's get them treated first and let's do the studies. So it'll involve NIHR funded studies across the whole of the United Kingdom. Uh, so if you watch out, if, if you've got us when you'd like to be enrolled in research and find out about what's going on at your local centre. And I hope in the next year or two, um, we'll have some more trials going on, giving these to people with milder asthma. Okay, thank you very much. Um, these will have to be very quick questions, but they're, they're questions that have been given to us um, during the chat. Um, we had one saying, um, what is it like in terms of the differences between people with different cultural backgrounds? And I guess that goes back to genetics to a certain extent. Um, are different cultures and uh, uh, different communities more likely to be diagnosed with asthma? Um, yes, thank you. That's a really good question and tricky to answer. Um, mm. We know there's differences between countries in asthma. Um, prevalence. Um, within UK uh, there will be genetic factors, um, so different cultural communities may have different background genetic factors, but actually we seem to see asthma occurring in Bangladeshi populations, uh, Pakistani, British, Polish, um, Afro-Caribbean, it seems to be across the board. What does make a big difference though is how people express their asthma, how, mm. how they respond to it and how they treat it. Um, some people are better at putting into words what it is that their symptoms are and getting treatment earlier. Some cultural communities are less good at um, getting the help they need. Uh, and they, that may be because doctors and nurses are not good at picking up on, oh, this could be asthma. Um, the, the other thing is that um, uh, different cultural backgrounds may affect how we treat our asthma. Some people are better at taking tablets, some people overuse tablets. Uh, and in some communities in UK, um, uh, there's a lot of resistance to using the inhalers. Inhalers can be life-saving and uh, we spend a lot of time trying to encourage people that inhalers are safe and they, they keep you keep you alive. They, and um, certainly um, in Leicester where I've done work, um, the, the Indian community there were quite resistant to using um, inhalers long-term because of a certain stigma in different cultures and, uh, and that worries me. Um, if mm. you've got asthma, you need that preventer inhaler. In yeah. UK, there are three people who die each day of asthma, uh, and most of those deaths are preventable, and we really want to stop that happening. Okay, great answer. So I've got four minutes. I'm going to um, pose two questions, <laughs> if we've got time for that. Um, the first one is very important to this chat. Um, what's it like being a participant in research as a patient um, in asthma, and um, how do you and, and your team and the people that you work with um, set about finding um, and uh, asking people to take part in research? Look, it's, it's great fun taking part in research. Um, uh, if you look in the chat, Oliver's put a B part of research for nihr.ac.uk website in. It will tell you about which studies are going on locally. So I'd really encourage people to check that out if you're at all interested. I'm healthy, I don't have asthma, but I've taken part in two research studies of asthma as a healthy control volunteer. Um, and uh, when we, yeah, this morning, for instance, I did five research bronchoscopies. Um, so I've had a long day. We were in there at eight o'clock and some of our volunteers gave up the morning to come in, go about breakfast and ha have some light sedation and a camera test put into their lungs. And um, 
uh, have some samples taken which are being processed in the lab today. I That's highly we've... recommend uh, Tim doing your bronchoscopy. He did one for me, so you know, he, you're in safe hands. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I might post in the chat um, some information about bronchoscopy research. Now, bronchoscopy research um, is not for everyone, so uh, but if you want to find out what's um, what's involved with that sort of research, um, which is what I'm really passionate about, then there are two very there's a website there where there's a link on the right hand side which can show a bronchoscopy video um other sorts of research could be much less invasive it could be trying a new inhaler and being randomized to one inhaler or another there's a lot of work going on with, with apps uh, on your iphone and, and these can help you control your asthma um if you're on a simbacort dry powder inhaler uh, then there are microchips we can fit to your inhaler which sync to your iphone so taking part in some of that research can be really helpful wow. and it doesn't involve taking time off uh, and the best thing is um really clinical trials where we're trying out these new biologics. Vicky took part in one of these and she got access to a new biologic drug which was not available in the UK. She got it years ahead of time, about what, three to five years. Well, it turned happened. out to be four years ahead of time in the end, yeah. yeah. So it took so long to be approved, yeah. Uh, so um, she's had a very positive research experience, but um, we, we, we're, we're regularly seeing people in our clinic who, who benefited from taking part in research earlier on. Um, so find out what's there, there will be a, a different sort of asthma research which is tailored to you whether it's something just done by the telephone a questionnaire type of thing whether it's your genetic study do you get in touch if you're that person whose great grandmother had asthma or if it's a bronchoscopy study um yeah lots going on and, and it could be new diagnostic studies as well yeah i would uh, echo all of that and highly recommend being involved i was um like many people um when i went to be assessed by a doctor i thought i was uh, there was nothing more that could be done for me than given more steroids and told to manage my asthma um, better but uh, was absolutely astounded that there were three different trials at the time that were going on that i could take um take part in so it's um it's, it's wonderful to be part of and to know that there's a legacy as well to that for other people which is fantastic very quickly tim i know we've only got a couple of minutes left if you're if you had your wish list what would you embark on researching next i know you've got lots going on <laughs> at the moment yeah. um, but what um would you so, to do next uh what i'm really excited about is um obesity a treatment for that so mm. some people's asthma is driven by obesity in america a quarter of a million people each year develop asthma as a consequence of obesity two-thirds of the people in my severe asthma clinic are overweight or obese and we know obesity is causing that asthma there's a new medicine out there called tizepatide which we think is going to be the world's most um uh most valuable medicine um, in, wow. in, the, in the few years ahead. I want that to be available for people with asthma. So I'm designing a clinical trial where we will randomize people to receive that treatment or not and see if it affects their asthma. If it does, then we'll be able to prescribe that in clinics across the UK, but we have to generate the data first. At the same time, some of them will have bronchoscopies and we'll use that weight loss. People lose 20% of their weight in one year with these injections. It's wow. phenomenal. We'll be able to see what it does in the airways mm. and mechanisms. So that's number one. Number two, I'd love to come up with some new diagnostic tests for asthma. There are a number of different contenders. We need the funding to, to try them out. Um, and number three, I, I'd like to see, um, I'll finish with this, um, I, I'd like to see an end to tablet steroids. Mm. Five years time, I think nobody should be having them. If you're needing them, you might as well have one of these new biologic injections. Maybe you have it just when you need it two or three times a year, maybe you have it long term. But the other sorts of fields of medicine have got rid of steroids. They said they're harmful. They've got bad side effects. We shouldn't be giving them their better treatments. So that's where we're heading. Um, better inhalers, better diagnosis, um, treatments for obesity, less steroids, new biologics. Wow. On that fantastically upbeat note, um, thank you so much, Tim. Um, I learned also a lot during that uh, seminar. And as as one of our uh, uh, webinar folks has said in the in the chat, they thought they were a lifelong expert. And of course, you are if you're a sufferer. But there's always more to know about. And there's always more to learn. And it's always um, very positive to hear what you're doing. Um, thank you to everyone for finding all your questions tonight. I hope you found it um, insightful and informative. Um, thank you also to our hosts, um, the National Institute for Health and Care Research. Um, if you want to know more about um, research and how you can take part again go to that uh, be part of research uh, website and also look at all the links that tim and and our team have put up um, for you um just remains for me to say um thank you again and um i hope you all have a lovely evening thank you thanks so much goodbye <laughs>